Welcome, this is Evil, a horror fiction podcast. I'm your narrator and producer, Dennis Sarah. Today we have two stories for you. First, The Gull by David Turton. And Tumor by G.A. Miller. Evil can be found on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, Stitcher, and almost any place podcasts can be found. For back episodes, you can also go to evilpodcast.com. You can contact me through the website or on Twitter at Dennis Sarah, on Facebook at facebook.com slash evilpodcast. Evil is made possible by its great listeners. If you can... Support us by subscribing on whatever podcast player you use. And if you can, go ahead and rate and review us. If you rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, that sure does give us a boost. And I'd like to thank our Patreons. If you'd like to become a Patreon, go to patreon.com slash evilpodcast or go to evilpodcast.com and follow the link. For as little as $1 a month, you can help support Evil Podcast. Or if you prefer, you can just hit a straight donation. In any amount, there's a donate button on evilpodcast.com. Our first story comes from David Turton. For those who have been listening, this is David's third submission, and I'm becoming a real fan of his. David is an author of dark fiction and horror. He's penned several short stories which have been published in various magazines and anthologies. I've been hearing good things about his novel due out later in 2018 called The Malaise. If you want to learn more about David, visit his website at davidturtonauthor.wordpress.com or you can follow him on Twitter at David Turton. I'll have links in the show notes. So without any further ado, The Gull by David Turton. I suffered a most terrible year in 1954. Sales of my debut novel, The Boat That Sank, had plateaued to such an extent that my income was non-existent, and I was living on savings. My wife had left me in the summertime, off to travel the world with her lover, Pedro. I don't blame her, really. I'm sure I'd become insufferable. My mood, my demeanor, and my general outlook on life had taken a drastic dip, while my alcohol consumption had flourished. The main cause of my depression had been writer's block. While riding the boat that sank, words had flowed from my fingertips like they were being ciphered from somewhere else other than my brain. The joy of discovery as my characters came alive onto paper, the satisfying sound of my fingers rhythmically tapping out the words on my Remington typewriter. But in the whole of 1954... I had only managed to sell two short stories for a total sum of ten pounds. Worse, my second novel just didn't happen. I worked through a dozen iterations, but each time I began, I just couldn't see the story through. So, in mid-January 1955, after the most miserable Christmas of my life, I decided to take my writer's block head on. I booked a cottage on the most remote island off the northwest coast of Scotland on the advice of Johnny, a hard-drinking Scot from my local pub. The Isle of Failig sat between Lewis and St. Kilda, a hunk of rock three kilometers by two. Legend has it, according to Johnny, that the island has only ever been inhabited by one man, a recluse who passed away later part of the 19th century. His cottage, the sole building on the island, was now available to rent for the bargain sum of one pound per week. Only one catch. Johnny had slurred in his thick Glaswegian tones, clutching a glass of whiskey. There's nothing there. 
no shop, no people, no pub. It would send most people mad. But if it's solitude you're after, there's no place like that on the planet. Not a living soul around, just you and the gulls. Sounded good to me. A week would be enough, I guessed. Even if I couldn't finish my novel, it could give me the push to actually start it and get a good way through it. And if I couldn't write somewhere like that, I couldn't write anywhere. Maybe it could even help me off the drink. It only took one phone call to someone called Stevie Black, a Scotsman who owns the small cottage and arranges transport to the island. I packed my typewriter and numerous tins of food. It was traveling the next day. A coffee-fueled 12-hour drive north from London to the Isle of Skye, where I met Stevie. Nutter? Stevie asked when I first met him and shook his large, rough hand. I beg your pardon? I asked, wondering if I had misheard, unused the original accent. You one of these nutters, eh? I see you type all the time, lad. Want to get away from it all. Something like that. Just want to be myself for a while, I suppose. I boarded his boat, and we set sail. Stevie skillfully navigated around the southern tip of Lewis, while I dozed at a wooden bench on deck. He wasn't much of a talker, and I was glad, especially after a twelve-hour drive. It was six o'clock, and darkness had taken hold. I was looking forward to my bed, no matter how hard and uncomfortable it may be. There she is. Stevie said, pointing. I looked over dozily and saw a gray rock jutting out of the sea. The strong wind soon brought the world around me into a sharp focus. Despite the late hour and the dark sky, I could make out dozens of seabirds flying and circling above the island. As we came closer, I could hear their loud wails alongside the crisp chorus of waves spraying against the rocks below. I shuddered at the noise and turned to see Stevie smiling at me. It's their land, he said, pointing at the gulls. They were now close enough to make out the yellow color of their bills, glowing dimly in the pale moonlight. See you in a week. Same place, same time. Didn't I forget. Enjoy your camping, lad. The boat turned, and soon it was a speck in the distance, rocking in the rough waves. I walked the half-mile journey to the college using hand-drawn map that Stevie had provided. The blustery conditions and lack of light made it difficult to find my footing on the rocky surface. But the cottage was the only building on the island, and so it didn't take long to find. As I came within a few meters of the small wooden door, which was framed by blocks of stone, I looked at the place, which was to be my home for the next seven days. Its windows glimmered in the moonlight, the width of them matching the shape of the cottage. The twinkling light on the panes of the darkness gave the cottage a sinister appearance, as if there was something living, aware of my approach. The roof was tiled but in a state of disrepair, covered in crusty white excrement, no doubt from the countless gulls circling overhead. I hoped there were no leaks or holes. Stevie had promised it was in good condition. I unlocked the door, which opened with a dusty sigh. The cottage itself was even smaller on the inside than it looked from the outside. It consisted of three rooms, a small bedroom, a kitchen, and a bathroom. I pulled three candles from my bag and lit them carefully, placing them in each room. The sour smell of the cottage would take some getting used to. I looked over at the bed and saw it had thin mattress and an old sheet. I groaned, cursing myself that I had only brought two towels and no bed sheets. In any case, I was exhausted. I dropped my bag on the floor and slumped onto the bed, fully clothed. Within thirty seconds, I was fast asleep. I dreamt of screaming children, several were running toward me on the tiny gray island while waves crashed in every direction, soaking their clothes and their hair. Their screams were loud and in short bursts, shrill and awful. 
making the hair stand up on my neck. But the sight of the children was worse than their sound. Each child had no eyes. Instead, two black chasms sat in their face. Dark red blood oozing down into their pale cheeks. They were coming towards me, their hands reaching, grabbing, pointing. When I woke abruptly, cold sweat was trickling down my temples. I looked over to the window and saw that the morning light burst through the window. A gull screamed above the cottage. Reaching into my bag for my watch, I noticed the time was half past eight. An early enough start. Ravenous, I opened a tin of tuna and ate it greedily with my fingers, not even waiting to drain the brine. Instead, it leaked on my fingers, the salty smell mixing pleasantly with the hard sea air. I took my typewriter out of the backpack and placed it on a solid wooden table, which sat on the opposite end of the room in the bed, and fed it with paper. I stroked it lovingly. My Remington, the machine that had changed my life in 1952, the vehicle for my story that sold in its thousands. I remember the first check in the post for a hundred pounds. It was a year's salary in one go. The next check came, and by the end of 1953, I had made six hundred pounds. I patted the Remington with a little more force this time. Don't let me down, old boy, I said to it. We did it before. We can do it again. I went back to my bag and pulled out tins of tuna, beans, vegetables, and corned beef. More than enough for a week. And, of course, no alcohol. It would pain me. I knew it would. During the three months it took to write the boat that sank, I drank whiskey every day. The alcohol helped relax my mind, bring up ideas, situations, characters that might have been stuck in a sober mind. Without the smooth passage that the lubrication of alcohol allowed. Or so I thought. The problem with my second novel led to more whiskey. More whiskey led to duller thoughts. Duller thoughts led to poor writing, or none at all. I'd lost count of the number of times I'd angrily ripped sheets from the Remington and screwed them up. Violently throwing them across the room, yelling, swearing, punching the desk, even throwing my precious typewriter onto the floor at one point. I had falsely credited the whiskey with my success, but I had done myself a disservice. It was all me. Without alcohol, without distraction, I would be able to find a way to unlock my talent once more. I glanced out the window. The cloudy gray sky seemed to beckon me outside. I wrestled with myself. Too easily distracted, I scolded. But what better way to get the creative juices flowing than a brisk walk in these picturesque surroundings? I opened the heavy door and closed it behind me, the bitter wind slapping my face. I pulled the key out of my pocket and locked the door and laughed at myself. Who would break into a college on an island in which I'm the only inhabitant? I replaced the key in my pocket and walked across the island to the opposite side from which I had landed the previous night. I froze the color draining from my face. A loud, high-pitched wail pierced the winter air, and I thought back to the dream that had terrified me before I woke. My hand jumped up to my chest in fright as my heart raced with an intense velocity. I turned sideways to the source of the noise and saw a gull standing on the old column of crumbling stone. Its head was the same height as me in its elevated position, and its bright yellow eyes burned into mine. Its yellow bill hooked downwards, giving the appearance of an angry frown, and I noticed a pink scar on its large white belly. It swayed slightly in the blistering wind. The gull threw its head back and yelled once more, a blood-curdling scream that seemed to echo across the gray rocks of this desolate island. I looked across and realized it wasn't an echo. Dozens of other gulls were circling over the cottage. My bones ached with a chill, although I wasn't sure whether it was the winter air or fright. I shook the thought away and laughed at myself. Silly fool, frightened by a seagull. What else did you expect on a remote island? I waved at the seagull and it cocked its head in curiosity. 
Thanks for the welcome, sir. I do hope you will enjoy having me in your beautiful home, I said. I turned away, laughing harder. As I walked over to the horizon, there was nothing else around this lump of rock other than the birds. Blue-gray sea filled the landscape, punctuated by patches of white surf. The sounds of the waves crashing against the rocks was louder than it had any right to be, the water almost exploding as it met the hard surface. After walking for around five minutes, I became aware of a darkness tingling in the already dim light directly above me. Then that horrible sound filled the air once more, a loud, sharp scream in short bursts. I turned quickly and looked upwards. It was the gull. It was swooping and fast. From less than a meter away, I could see its yellow eyes again. They were focused and alert. I ducked, and the gull swooped back up, chunting vocally as it descended into the murky sky. You bastard! Leave me alone! I shouted. I ran underneath a nearby tree for safety. I stayed there for an hour, carving my name into the bark. Already shaken, a crack of thunder made me jump and signaled the onset of a heavy shower. With a burst of confidence and energy, I ran back to the cottage. Paranoid, I looked up at the skies after every few steps. It slowed me down, and the rain that was cascading from the dark clouds fell heavily into my face. But the thought of that gull swooping down while I faced the other way was too much to bear. Luckily, the skies were empty. I had made it to the college and threw myself on the bed, panting heavily with exertion. I looked over at the typewriter. Oh, how I could do with a drink, I thought to myself. I was a pathetic man, I concluded. A man who came to a deserted island to escape humanity, and even here... I see demons, enemies waiting to attack me. Maybe the world is too hard a place for a man like me. Even a common bird holds fear and violence in my tortured, broken mind. Most men would have laughed it off, maybe even fought the gull off. But not me. I make it a trigger for an existential crisis. I shook the thought away. Remember why you came. I thought to myself, forcefully. I walked over to the typewriter and began to write. The hours went by and the words flowed. It felt fantastic. Characters formed and began living and breathing through my words. The rhythm of the Remington's keys sang back to me like it was 1953 all over again. Maybe the gull did me a favor. Maybe the big white flying bastard had been the key to unlocking the talent that had been hiding inside me for so long. Two thousand words turned into five thousand, five to ten. And as the sun set into the rough waters of the western side of the island, I had completed twenty-five thousand words. I was tempted to write more, but my fingers burned and I needed food. I grabbed a tin of corned beef stuffing the meat into my mouth, barely pausing to swallow until my mouth was full. As I put the tin in a makeshift bin under the sink, I stopped and stared at the shelf next to it. There was a bottle of whiskey unopened, sitting dustily behind the bin. I placed my hand on my head and ruffled my hair in disbelief. It would be great to have a drink now, I thought. I adverted my eyes from the bottle. It had been three days with a drink, and today was the best day I had in over a year. Surely that was a sign to ignore the whiskey. I walked out of the kitchen briskly and sat on the bed, wringing my hands. I still wasn't tired, but I had decided to leave any further writing until early tomorrow morning. I looked at the wooden door encased in its stone surroundings and decided to go for a walk. Darkness had descended on the Isle of Failing and the gull would be dozing, or even asleep. Even if it wasn't, I wanted to prove that I was mad enough to face it again. It's not like a gull was a deadly animal, after all. I walked out the door and looked up. A few gulls glided at the other end of the island, looking like black shapes in the dark blue sky. 
but none looked too close or ominous. I walked on, deciding to complete a lap on the island. If I walked briskly, it would take less than three quarters of an hour. I made it thirty minutes, and I could see the college in the distance when I heard its yell, a rasping guttural screech that could have risen from the pits of hell itself. I turned to see the descending gull right above my head, but this time I was ready to fight. I clasped my fist around a thin, cold leg. Its screaming became louder and panicked. Yet again I looked into those cold yellow eyes and saw the pink scar on the otherwise pristine white body. Time seemed to slow down as I pulled the leg toward me, each wing stretching wildly and cut through the moist air as they rapidly moved up and down. I felt a sharp pain at the top of my head and then a warm sensation down my face. The gull had surged forward and jabbed me with its sharp bill. Staggering, I let go of its leg and its sword in the night sky. With one hand on my wounded head, I ran clumsily back to the cottage. Less than thirty yards from the door, I stumbled at a rock and sprawled comically across the ground, rolling three times before stopping. I shook my head and glanced upwards. The large shadow of the gull was sweeping across the sky. In my days, I saw it as a huge crucifix, ominous and terrible. I might have imagined it, but I'm sure, even twenty yards below it, on the cold ground, that I could see its evil yellow eyes and its malevolent grimace. It screamed again into the night, its sharp yell causing my hair to stand on end and icy shiver to run through my whole body. I gathered my senses and clumsily threw myself to my feet. As I reached the front door, I heaved it open and fell inside the cottage. I lay on the floor, panting heavily, my head throbbing. My mind immediately went to the whiskey. Three days without a drink was nothing. Most people, even relatively hard drinkers, grow through that without really thinking. And it could help with the pain. I jumped to my feet and walked over to the bottle. I uncorked it with some effort and poured it into a glass. Walking back to the bedroom, I swilled the whiskey in the glass, releasing its sweet smell into the air. I sniffed up the fumes, and my eyes rolled with pleasure. I deserve this, I thought. I sat on the bed and looked at the glass, wanting to savor it, to delay it as long as possible, to hurt myself, tease myself in some way, for some deep psychological reason that I couldn't comprehend. I'd been through too much on my short time on this tiny island to regret drinking whiskey. As I raised the glass to my lips, closing my eyes as I prepared to taste the thick, sweet liquid, my concentration was broken by the sound of smashing glass. I looked over the window and felt a freezing gust of wind sting my cheeks. The gull's head emerged through the smashed window. It squeezed through cutting itself on those shards of glass, smattering red blood on its white body. It paused and yelled its awful cry, a grisly sound that gave me an instant chill in my heart. I froze as it entered the cottage, dropping onto the stone floor below the window. The gull flapped its huge wings and jumped at me, its talons facing my body. Once more I grabbed its feet and again it thrust its bill forward. I cried in pain as the seagull jabbed me in the right eye my vision filling with red blood before becoming blurred and dark. I felt the blood trickle, warm and wet, down my face. I looked on in numb shock as my eyeball clasped in the gull's yellow bill, the oozing red blood contrasting with the yellow of its sharp beak. Nonchalantly, the gull flipped my eyeball into its mouth and swallowed. In a bizarre sense of watching the scene from outside of my body, I saw the lump of my eyeball making its way down the bird's throat. Squinting so that the vision of my remaining eye was as focused as possible, I yanked its feet again, but this only made it angrier. With a violent jerk, the gull plunged its beak into the soft flesh of my stomach. I could feel the intense, searing pain of its grabbing something from inside me and pulling it out. I didn't know what part of me I was looking at as the gull its face a mess of red gore, emerged with something thick and stringy from a gaping wound in my gut. 
The gull was murdering me where I sat, on the cold, hard bed on this desolate island. Reaching forward painfully, I grabbed the gull's long neck with both hands. I squeezed as hard as I could and heard popping, cracking sounds. I laughed maniacally and stared into those yellow eyes. They were still taunting, mocking me. I screamed into the gull's face and twisted my arms, the extra effort causing my muscles to tighten and strain against my jumper. I released a wild cry of aggression, a warlike scowl that echoed back to me through the smashed window from the misty dark outside the cottage, as the gull's head ripped jaggedly from its body. Crimson blood gushed from its broken body, and I threw the evil bird's head down right on the stone floor. I sat back, pulled a pillow against the wound of my stomach, and laughed. Victory was mine. The enemy crushed with nothing but my own power. I now know that I will die in this cold, lonely college on this cold, lonely island. I'm not really sure how long it takes for infection to set in but I can smell the awful odor coming from my empty eye socket. It smells tangy, like rotting cheese mixed with almonds. I stop putting pressure on my stomach wound, and I'm now watching as my blood seeps out and trickles onto the stone floor like a morbid waterfall. I hope I bleed out soon. That would be for the best. More have come, you see. Five or six gulls just squeezed through the smashed window one by one and are making the way to my bed. One piece of good news. I have my whiskey. I just hope it takes off the edge of the pain that is to come. A gull just jumped up onto my bed and I can see his yellow eyes staring into my soul. That was The Goal by David Turton. Again, you can find David on Twitter at David Turton or his website, davidturtonauthor.wordpress.com. There'll be links in the uh, show notes. Be sure to check out his other works. Our next story is Tumor by G.A. Miller. G.A. Miller actually had a story on our November podcast episode. G.A. Miller resides in New England where Lovecraft lived and due south of where King lives. You can find his website at gamiller.info. His Twitter handle is gamiller666. I'll put links in the show notes where you can find him and his works. Now, Tumor by G.A. Miller. The ambulance roared through the midday traffic, lights on, sirens blaring. Bill was trying to get their patient to the hospital as quickly as he could, while his partner Ernie worked on him in the back. He heard Ernie radio ahead, reading the vitals, and he knew it didn't sound promising. Shit! He yelled, notching the wheel slightly to the left and leaning on the horn to avoid an idiot in a Toyota who was starting to turn on red, despite the blaring siren. Thankfully, the hospital was just ahead now. He drove up into the ER bay, swinging around and backing in as close to the doors as possible. The automatic door slid open as the ambulance backed in, Dr. Charles Green leading two nurses out to meet the EMT crew. "'What do we have?' he asked, as they carefully lifted the gurney out and dropped the legs. William Cavanaugh, 37-year-old male, collapsed in his home after complaining of a severe headache. His wife listed the headache along with blurred vision, loss of balance, confusion, and seizures. His vitals are weak, and he has a pronounced swelling on the left side of his head. Ernie recounted, calm and professional. Charles, the resident on duty, examined the patient, checking pupillary response and noted the swelling on the head seemed to be moving, pulsing rhythmically. He gently felt the swollen area and pulled his hand back, 
feeling a sharp pain in his fingertip. Damn, must have gotten a paper cut and didn't even notice it, he thought. Get him to the OR and prep him, stat. No time for an MRI. We need to relieve the pressure on the brain. The EMTs and nurses transferred the patient to another gurney, and the nurses rolled it to the elevator as the EMTs gathered and packed their gear. Charles called the neurosurgeon on call and advised him of the patient's conditions and vitals, who agreed with his initial diagnosis and said he was on his way. Hanging up, Charles felt perplexed. He'd seen all sort of trauma in the ER, but the way the swelling was pulsing was unsettling. The patient had all the signs of a brain tumor, but tumors don't pulse. Their growth is slow and steady until addressed, and certainly, and certainly not visible externally. He planned to speak with George Cohen, the neurosurgeon, after his surgery and inquire about the odd swelling and what he'd found. For the moment, however, he had patients to tend to in the ER, so he pushed the curiosity aside and went back into the hospital, idly thinking he'd need to grab a band-aid for his finger. Who was that, dear? Ruth Cohen asked, looking up from her book. That was Dr. Green. He has a patient with an unusual cranial condition that I need to look at. Oh, my. Shall I call Mike and Ellen and tell them we won't be there for dinner this evening? Not just yet, dear. I don't believe this procedure will take too long, but of course I won't know for sure until I have a look. I'll let you know if I will be longer than I expect. They both stood, Ruth giving George a hug and a kiss, and he walked through the kitchen to the garage, patting his pockets to ensure he had his keys in his wallet, as Ruth put on a kettle to prepare a cup of tea. Dr. Cohen arrived 20 minutes later, heading right up to the OR suites. He scrubbed in as Donna Caputo, the head nurse, gave him the background on their patient's condition. She slipped the gloves on him, and they entered the OR together. The patient was prepped, his head clean, shaven, and glistening in the bright lights. The growth on the side of his head was pulsing, clearly visible now to all. All right, let's see what we have here, shall we? he asked, picking up a scalpel from his instrument tray. Dr. Cohen made an incision, his hand sure and steady, then another, and one more, allowing him to peel back the skin, exposing the mass. His hand wavered momentarily as he tried to process what he saw. The bone of the skull was already open, the mass attached directly to the brain. The edges of the opening in the skull were rounded and thick, as though the bone had somehow melted away to allow the intrusion. He realized he'd need to graft bone in order to protect the cranial cavity, but first he had to remove the mass and get it to the lab for dissection and analysis. It resembled a large tumor, thickly textured with bulging veins, but the way it pulsed was revolting, unlike anything he had ever seen. He carefully began separating the mass from the brain, precisely incising the base to ensure the brain tissue remained untouched. He tipped the mass back, which revealed a number of tentacles at its base, extending into the brain matter. They were also pulsing, as though drawing the brain matter up into the mass itself. Tipping the mass further back, he cut through the tentacles to release it. He'd have to extract those individually once the mass was removed. He made a mental note to let Ruth know this would indeed be longer than anticipated after all. He cut the last one, noting the thick yellowish fluid oozing through the ends and set the scalpel down to lift the mass out and place it on a waiting specimen tray. As he lifted away from the patient, a flap in its center moved, sliding open to reveal a single eye, fixing him with a malevolent stare. He barely had time to register his shock at seeing the eye when his right hand exploded in a bright flare of pain, his yell making the nurse jump. The mass had injected a set of tentacles into his hand which began pulsing immediately. His arm grew cold, then numb as something began moving upward through his veins. The eye rolled back, 
the flap slowly covering it while the mass began pulsing again, just as it had done on the patient's brain. The head nurse reached for the mass, and he moved his arm away. Don't touch it, Donna. God knows what it'll do to you. But your hand. Never mind that. Please, I, I need you to apply a tourniquet in my bicep before, before. He never finished. His eyes opening wide, unfocused. His mouth hung open, a line of drool falling onto his gown. He wavered, losing his balance and falling against the table, jostling the prone patient. His knees bent as he slid down to the floor, falling on his back. The cap slipped off his head and Donna cried out. Oh God, his head! Look at his head! His head began swelling on the left side, exactly as the patient's had. She looked at his hand and the mass had diminished, nearly gone now. Was that thing somehow traveling up through his arm, into his head? Oh shit, I'm not seeing this the anesthesiologist exclaimed, pointing to the patient. The bases of the tentacles were growing out, seeking and joining with each other, reforming into a new mass right before their eyes. The monitors confirmed the patient had flatlined, yet the tentacles remained very active in his exposed brain. Donna turned and walked to the door, striking the red button mounted on the wall next to it. The lighting in the operating room changed, and alarms went off outside as the doors locked. What just happened? asked Bernice Palmer, the assistant nurse. I put us under lockdown, Bernice. I don't know what's happening in here. But whatever it is took out Dr. Cohen, and I don't want it spreading outside this room. What about us? Bernie asked, the fear evidence in her voice. Protocol, Bernice. They'll be here soon. John Everett, the anesthesiologist, explained. She's right. We need to isolate this thing until we can find out what the hell is going on. John began shaking and stuttering, his balance growing unsteady before collapsing on the floor. Bernice screamed as she looked down and saw the tentacles from Dr. Cohn's extended hand had slithered across the floor to John, sliding up inside his pant leg. Donna grabbed Bernice by the arm and pulled her over to the doors, reaching for the phone on the wall. As she lifted the handset, she heard the ding of the elevator arriving and set it back onto the base. Oh, thank God, she said, but gasped when she saw Dr. Green stagger out of the elevator by himself, hand against his head, blood seeping between his fingers. Where the hell were the containment personnel, and what happened to Dr. Green? Donna's hands were shaking badly now. As he staggered toward the doors and unsteady legs, she saw that a tentacle had pierced through his left eye from within, wavering in front of his face through the ruined socket. She instinctively knew it was looking, seeking something. He nearly made it to the door when he collapsed face down in front of them. Donna began to reach out for the release button, stopping when she saw the tentacles fanning out across the floor from beneath Green's prone body. No way out. Bernice screamed again as Donna grabbed the handset from the wall phone and heard nothing. The line was out, not even a tone as she pounded the buttons to dial for help. She let the phone slip out of her hand as the two nurses turned back to face the room and saw countless tentacles slithering across the floor toward them. Bernice fainted, and Donna tried to catch her, but was knocked to the floor by her unexpected weight. The last thing Donna saw were the tentacles moving faster now, sensing her. And once they pierced through her eyes, seeking her brain within, Donna's world became dark and quiet. That was Tumor by G.A. Miller. I would encourage you to seek out G.A. Miller's work as well. Go to his website, gamiller.info. His Twitter handle, gamiller666. I'll put links in the show notes to his information. I would like to thank both authors for submitting stories, both G.A. Miller and David Turton. I do appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Evil Podcast is accepting submissions. If you'd like to hear me narrate your story, 
please send it into my email address at mr at yahoo.com or you can go through the website evilpodcast.com again i'm on twitter at dennis sarah and facebook at facebook.com slash evil podcast thank you for listening and remember be good Evil Podcast is copyrighted by Dennis Sarah. The individual stories in the episode are copyrighted by their respective authors. Music is by Kevin McLeod.